Please, let's give a warm welcome to Genesis Robinson. I feel as though I can't really live up to all that. I don't feel as though I've achieved that. And I must say, listening, uh, watching Michelle's presentation just now made me realize just how little I know, um, way above my head. Uh, this is where you all fall asleep. Um, or at least I try to keep you awake. I'm really grateful to you for having invited me here. Um, Chris got together with Anna Britton, who runs Napa Green, and cleverly they have put together two rather similar events so that one trip over the Atlantic, I can go to both. But when he initially uh, invited me, uh, or they invited me, I did say, these are sustainability events. Shouldn't I just be doing it by Zoom? Um, but no, they said, we're fed up with Zoom and we, we really want a live event. And certainly live is appropriate for today. Um, it's provided a wonderful opportunity for me to try desperately to catch up with all that's been happening in the Oregon wine industry. I have been to IPNC three times, I think, including once filming for a BBC TV series. Um, I'm very fond of Oregon, and when last May, my paper, the, the FT, held its first weekend festival in the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., and I was asked to present a wine tasting, I chose Oregon Chardonnays to showcase, because... <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I felt we should, you know, teach those East Coasters what's, what's going on here. Um, but of course, I, I, I can't possibly grasp everything. And fortunately for us at JancisRobinson.com, we have a, a pretty brilliant Oregon-based correspondent in the form of Samantha Cole Johnson, whom I know many of you know, and um, I've heard some, a lot of nice things said about her, and we are very proud to have her on the team. Um, mainly, though, I'd just like to thank all of you, whether growers or winemakers, for providing me with such pleasure and knowing so much detail that I, I don't. I view myself, I don't put it in my bio, but I do view myself seriously as a parasite on the wine business, um, that I kind of sit on the sidelines and try to observe it, um, communicate to the public what, what I see, but you provide me not just with fantastic liquids, but a living. Thank you very much indeed. I'm based in London, um, which is a pretty good place because it's to, to write about the world of wine, because it's a great wine drinking center and a great wine trading center has been for a long time. And is actually starting to become more of a wine producer. Um, but also, uh, I'm also, so that, that provides me with a great perspective, helped by the fact that every few years I've got to update either the World Atlas of Wine or the Oxford Companion to Wine. So I get a pretty good overview of, of what's happening or try to, in the whole world of wine. So all I'm going to give you is my current observations of, of what's going on in the world of wine, which I hope will be of interest and possibly some use. If only to, for you to all discuss it afterwards and say, she's completely wrong with that sort of thing. Anyway, my, um, to kick off with, I would suggest that an awful lot of the major things that happen to the world of wine are completely unexpected, uh, such as, if I could mention those initials, SBB. I mean, that Silicon Valley bank collapse just came out of the blue, didn't it? And I was thinking of all those West Coast wine producers on that horrible weekend. Um, uh, and that, who could have predicted that, really? The horrible fires, which, um, you know, Again, out of the blue, really. I can think of one nice, one good thing that came out of the blue, which, but it was an awfully long time ago. It was that uh, edition of 60 Minutes that suddenly told all Americans that drinking red wine was good for them, um, which really did make a huge difference to, um, to the wine world. We could even say that Sideways um, 
played a part, and, and that, that also came out of the blue. Um, COVID came out of the blue, and um, there are too many people saying that something like that could easily happen again for us to ignore, I think, what we learnt during COVID. And I would urge you to, to, to audit what you learnt and, and remember it so that next time, <laughs> we don't know what the next thing is, but I'm sure there will be some lessons that will come out of that, which, which unfortunately may prove useful in the future. Uh, I've been writing about wine since 1975. Um, I used to be proud of that date. Now I'm starting to go, oh, it sounds an awful long time ago. Um, and this current era is the very first time in all that period that I have seen the wine market shrink. Well, I've, I've been very lucky. I've just seen sales go up and up and up, whether in this country or, or in the UK. Of course, they've been going down in continental Europe for decades, but they were at a very, very high level before. Um, and I'm sad about that, and I'm not sure that if someone came to me in their early 20s now and said, should I be a wine writer, they won't have as easy a time, I don't think. There won't be as many opportunities. Um, and it's, it's sort of easy, sadly, to see why the market is shrink the total market is shrinking. There's a lot more competition. Uh, you know, it used to be that spirits were a bit boring, but now there are some really, really interesting spirits. There are craft beers, and there's even teetotalism, which seems to be catching on, which is something to be thoroughly discouraged, I think. But uh, <laughs> people are very keen on their health nowadays. Uh, there's less but better and premiumization. But sadly, there is a, a gap widening between consumers, the people at the bottom of the market and the people at the top. And the world seems to be creating more and more billionaires. And I always say billionaires need billionaires drinks. You know, there's a reason that there are some wines that are just ridiculously overpriced. Let the billionaires have them. They, they, they perform a function, those ridiculously priced wines. But I don't think you have many of them, do you? I think you seem to be pretty sensible. Um, now, a great opportunity for you, of course, is that partly thanks to the number of billionaires, particularly in China, and people telling them that they should drink Burgundy, Burgundy prices, as I'm sure I don't have to remind you, have been going through the roof, which is a great opportunity for you if you have enough money, enough wine to sell. It's my um, great sadness that you export so little and we see relatively little uh, Oregon wine in the UK, which is a shame because it's so good. Please make more, please export more. Don't ignore, and I fully appreciate that selling at the farm gate is the most profitable thing you can do and the easiest thing you can do. But uh, it would be nice if Oregon wine were not confined to Oregon and a few American states, um, certainly for those of us who appreciate it. At least the market, there are opportunities for widening the market. Um, and uh, one of the uh, women uh, is uh, increasingly important consumers. And there's the whole ethnically diverse m markets. Um, you know, here we all are, uh, pretty much all white. And there are so many different nationalities and ethnicities who are keen to get into wine. We need to be talking to them. Um, and, and opening our doors and employing them. Um, communication. And I, the, we landed on um, Monday night and the whole of the bit of Portland where we're staying had no internet for most of Tuesday. And it does make you realize how incredibly dependent on the internet we are. And um, not least for, tel for communicating about your products. I mean, that is the main way. When was the last time you put an ad somewhere on, on a bit of paper? Um, the online is the way that you communicate and people want stories. I'm sure there are people here who have brilliant websites and brilliant um, people who are te telling writers about themselves but I'm sure, also sure there's a lot of ways that you can improve that. And um, I would strongly suggest that you 
realize how at this particular point in history, and it's not going to happen for much longer, old, younger people are much, much better than us oldies at the whole internet techie thing. Uh, I loved it when during lockdown everybody had to start selling online and suddenly, you know, that 20-year-old kid in the corner who, that everyone was paying peanuts was the only guy who could, you know, create the website to, to sell the, the wine on. Um, I would strongly suggest, it, uh, strongly suggest that you give younger people a break, you realise what they can do for you, particularly online. Now, there's a, macro trends have to include climate change, of course, and I don't have to tell you all about that. Uh, it's becoming, it's putting all sorts of pressures on viticulture in particular. We we're just talking about harvest dates, but it's all, viticultural detail now is so important. Uh, picking dates are getting more and more critical. Um, you are lucky, relatively, because you don't have a massive shortage of water, do you? I mean, sometimes the reverse. Um, but uh, Jean-Francois Koch of Koch Dury, whose Mercos sell for an absolute fortune, told some friends of mine the other day that he d doesn't think that they'll be making w wine in 20 years' time because they are so short of water and they don't have a, a ready supply. The, the most obvious supply goes straight to the city of Dijon. That is scary for Burgundians, but it is an opportunity for you. But that is how bad things are. Um, all weather events, I, I don't have to tell you, are getting more intense and, and much less predictable. Um, and, you know, there you are with the frost, you know, fires, frost. It's, it really is crazy, and um, we cannot afford to ignore it. And so, of course, sustainability is top of everyone's, most people's agenda. Um, we have a wine writing competition every summer and a different theme every year. So three years ago, the theme was sustainability. And people had to write about a particular producer who was particularly sustainable. And there were a nice lot of Oregon uh, subjects, I'm glad to say. Uh, two years ago, it was um, Old vines. Old vines very important in the whole picture of um, sustainability, being so much more sustainable than, than young ones. And we all need to get together to um, ensure that old vines are not pulled needlessly out of the ground, not least because they can make such good wine. And then last year it was regeneration, and we, people could interpret it quite widely, but um, obviously the, we were keen to publicise the importance of soil health and regenerative viticulture. Um, this, we just announced this week the theme for this year, if any of you want to enter, which is, because I just thought those last three topics required a lot of work on the part of the competitors. So this year you have to come up with um, a written and possibly visual uh, portrait of your favorite wine person, which I think I'm really looking forward to reading those entries. So we, on chancesrobinson.com, We've always had a very sustainable um, bent. Um, lots and lots of profiles of organic, biodynamic, regenerative. But I have to say that um, I was in New Zealand recently, and I will quickly add that the organizer of my trip had calculated down to the last whatever the carbon emissions associated with it and is um, backing a soil, um, a tree planting project on the east coast of New Zealand to the tune of those carbon emissions. Um, I had a, the most interesting tasting, I think, of my life in New Zealand. I was given two wine glasses, and in one was the soil from a conventionally farmed vineyard, and in the other was the soil from a, bi in this case, it was a biodynamically farmed vineyard. I think it could be regeneratively. And the, as you will know, the conventionally soil was kind of powdery, dusty, looked dead, smelt of nothing. And the other one was just full of life, lots of little microbes and vine roots and interesting stuff just to look at, but it just smelt so full of life. And I would think to you, if you're in your tasting rooms or something, um, you could do that. Um, as long as you got your n nasty soil discreetly, 
um, you, you could do that quite uh, easily. And, and it, it's just such a simple illustration to, to the general public. Um, I'm glad I congratulate the, you who are certified because I think it really does make a difference to the general public to see the commitment of people who take the trouble to get certified. Obviously, certifications vary. Um, I was a little bit dubious when I was told in New Zealand that of 96 or 97 percent of wine producers in New Zealand are agreed certified according to the New Zealand Sustainable Programme. That doesn't sound quite demanding enough to me. But um, even Bordeaux is on the, um, th the track now. You know, for years they used to say, no, we can't possibly be organic. Our climate's too humid. Um, but the, it, organic viticulture is growing uh, in, and even a little bit of biodynamic. Chateau Latour has its horses. Uh, in Bordeaux. Biodiversity is a big buzzword in Bordeaux now. And um, in fact, very recently at two dinners, I was sat next to um, the owners of um, uh, Chateau Ferrier and um, Claire Lurton and um, Aubage Liberal. And she was gangbusters on, on uh, regenerative viticulture. That's in, in Poyac and Margot. And then the, another time, sitting next to the very switched on young winemaker, Chef de Carbe at Bollinger, and he ditto. You know, and those regions, Bordeaux and uh, Champagne, have not been famous for um, being, having the same concerns as you. So I think the world is changing. And not least because younger people are putting pressure on. I mean, it, it's young people are going to have to live with our changing world and they are really, really worried. And they are much more prepared, I think, than older people to um, take the, the trouble to learn about the background to what they, they buy and, and be much more determined. Um, winery stuff as opposed to vineyard stuff. I don't know, is there, nobody here is doing carbon capture, are they? But that is happening. Dujac, uh, new winery in Moray Saint Denis has been designed to capture the carbon given off by fermentation, which uh, you know is a, is a bit crazy that that carbon dioxide just whizzes up into the air, uh, and they've done all the calculations. It's not just a bit of um, window dressing or greenwashing. Um, waste um, is does does live certification look into waste, winery waste? Chris, yes, good, good, good. That's very important. Uh, I tasted a wine the other day in London. It was a biodynamic um, collection. That's the, the salmon. <laughs> um, and uh, it was a wine that was labeled, its name was L-I-E-S. And there were people coming up saying, why have you got this wine called Lies? But actually, it was a blend of this particular slightly wacky producer's Lies, Lies, Lies in French being, you know, spelt Lies, uh, and um, sediment from all his 2021s, aged, I think, under floor in fiberglass, and he was selling it for £68 a bottle quite successfully. So that's something to do with your waste. <laughs> now, I think I've mainly been asked to talk about packaging because that's it's not your, not the grower's end of the spectrum, but it is my end of the spectrum. Um, receiving wine, noticing what, what it's packaged in. And as, as I'm sure you all know, um, glass bottles account at the moment in terms of production and energy for a good 40% of all the carbon emissions associated with wine. And I had my first um, visit to a bottle factory quite recently and um, saw how those furnaces are just, I mean, they, they have to beat it up to, they have to be on 24-7, 365 days a year at 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. So just think of the energy that goes into that, even before you're transporting the bottles. And sometimes you're transporting the bottles twice on their way to being filled and then being transported again to the consumer. So it is a very scary thing. 
Glass is a wonderful material. This is our conundrum for wine that's going to be aged. But that is actually the minority of wine produced. So I'm very um, keen to encourage people to realize that uh, inexpensive wine, everyday wine, does not have to be in glass. Not least because the shape of a bottle is so um, inconvenient in terms of space. Um, you know, you, it's round for a start, so there's lots and lots of space between every bottle. And it's got that sort of bit at the top, which is completely empty. Compare and contrast, say, with bag in box, is that we call it, you know, uh, where you can tight it, tightly pack it all. There's no spare um, space. Um, cans, I think, can be very useful for, for certain occasions, sports or, or picnics or whatever. I'd like to see the very posh um, picnic suppers at Glyndebourne Opera. Um, I'd like to see people with their ring pulls and, and their, in their evening dress. Um, there are lots and lots of, of possibilities. And the sooner we can educate consumers and marketeers um, that there is no connection between the weight of a bottle and the quality of the wine inside, the better. It is, I believe, the tide is turning, but not everywhere. Um, Argentina, parts of uh, Eastern Europe, parts of this country, there is still that whack it into a, a big bottle. And sadly, there are, I mean, I, I can think of one very important Languedoc producer who's totally wedded to biodynamic viticulture and puts pretty much all, all his basic wine into lightweight bottles, but puts the top of the range still into really heavy bottles. And that's reinforcing that message that there is a link between quality and the weight of the bottles, which we all know is not true. Um, it is crazy because the Bordeaux first growths don't actually use particularly heavy bottles. Um, I don't know where, this I where the idea came from, but um, the sooner we do away with it, the better. I've been interested in bottle weight since 2006, um, not just for the sake of the planet, but for the sake of people in the wine trade who have to lift cases full of really heavy bottles. Um, and nowadays, um, I, all of us on JancisRobinson.com, if we're tasting at home, um, we weigh the bottles and we publish how much they weigh because, so because we want to pat the lightweighters on the back and we want to point the finger at the people who are still using really heavy bottles. The um, SAQ, a Quebec monopoly in Canada, um, they have said that they are going to stop buying wine in bottles that are more than 420 grams or 15 ounces. They've, um, which should be quite strong enough. Um, in the UK, they have already sold 250 million bottles under 350 grams. And that's, you know, I, I monitor this, and it, there used to be a time when I could pretty much tell by looking at a bottle what it weighed. Light bottles look cheap. Doesn't, it's not the case anymore. I've found m it more and more difficult to guess. I think the designs have got better or something like that. Um, but today, you can get a lightweight bottle that does the business, and um, not least because the cardboard uh, packaging in cartons has got so much better. Um, it really does keep the bottles um, steady. Um, and, um, you know, it's just so much better for the planet. Uh, there's a sustainable wine working group in the UK, which includes Whole Foods, actually, and the Monopolies in Scandinavia, and they've been researching wine packaging. And um, they are, they will be, all their members will be lightweighting down to the weight that they decide is right. Craggy Range is probably the best known New Zealand wine producer owned by a kind of Australo-American businessman. Their bottle, I always used to, really good wines, really heavy bottles. Um, their bottles used to be 900 grams and they've reduced them to 500. And uh, Julian Grounds, who was an intern at Ponzi once upon a time, um, said, you know, the, the external, he said, the external pressure from distributors is the best thing that happened to us 
meaning it was the distributors who were persuading them to, to lightweight the bottles, and that the dollar savings resulting were, were the most powerful thing to show our owner. I had an email from Native Flora. Is there anyone here from Native Flora? It's a local wine producer, very small, I think. Um, and she said that she's been using less, bottles less than 500 grams since the 2010 vintage, uh, 467 grams today. We ship 90% of our production to consumers all across the USA and only have three or four damage incidents per thousand shipments. Jason Haas of Tablas Creek uh, tweeted, I think, the other day, or, or blogged, that he's saved $2.2 million at a conservative estimate in the 14 years he's been using less heavy bottles. Styria ha in Austria have their own special bottle, which uh, you can take back to a nominated supermarket, get some money back, and it all is recycled. And I'm delighted to hear that there may be um, a, a recycling scheme here, which sounds pretty good, so yeah. Um, and um, the leading wine exporter from Romania, um, he's gone down to um, tens, he says, I've used tens of millions of bottles, 365 grams, but he only managed to persuade his local bottle factory to produce them after a long struggle. Um, but he's, he's a bit worried about the emissions which occur by t re recycling. Because recycling, of course, is the major thing. Do we, um, do we just throw the bottles away? Are they properly recycled and turned into um, bottles again? And the, um, the percentage of recycling in all over the world varies enormously, doesn't it? I mean, in Scandinavia, it's brilliant. Switzerland, Germany, they're so well behaved and they really look after it. In Britain, we're not great. It's all, it's all down to little local authorities who have long-term contracts and sometimes it's shipped to landfill. But um, I think we're better than the US generally, which, where total recycling rates are rather shockingly low. And I, I, I would imagine in Oregon it's better than most. Um, uh, recycled glass is currently 52% in Europe, so it could be a lot better. Um, I banned polystyrene styrofoam uh, years and years ago, perhaps in 2006. Whenever anybody wants to send a sample bottle, I say, I'm not going to review it if it comes in styrofoam. And not least, those horrible little white things that you can't get rid of. Um, but then that just goes to um, landfill. It, it, you can't recycle it. Um, where are we doing on time? I'm, I should shut up very soon. Uh, workforce, financial sustainability is obviously very important. Um, and workforce sustainability. Um, I'd, I hope there are huge labor problems all over the wine world, it seems to me. And um, surely we're going to be seeing more and more robotics in the vineyard. I think that's just a given. Um, I would like to see more diversity, as I've mentioned. Um, we've, this Gerard Basset Foundation that you mentioned, founded in the name of this lovely guy, Gerard Basset, who became the best sommelier in the world on his sixth attempt um, and died a um, few years ago with his widow and very competent son and Ian Harris, the ex-head of the WSET. We're the trustees of the foundation. And we've so far given 40 scholarships um, uh, and granted funding of about a million dollars to 34 grantees all over the world in the name of promoting diversity through education. Um, we've got some people moving through the Master of Wine and MS programs at the moment. Um, and uh, one thing people forget about talking about diversity and stuff is disability. Our Burgundy correspondent is a wonderful guy called uh, Matthew Hayes who had a terrible accident when he was on a bike. So he is a wheelchair user and he manages to visit every domain in Burgundy um, thanks to largely to lifts that are there for the barrels. Um, there's just one place he had any difficulty at all. It was Benjamin LaRue in Bone, who's got a few steps going up to his, his entrance. So they just had to 
carry him. But, you know, I could see wheelchair users being a real asset in a, in a tasting room, for instance, you know? There's no, no reason why not. So I think that's just something to bear in mind. Very rapidly, sort of big trends in wine. You know that oak has become a bugbear. Obvious oak's become a bugbear. Uh, alcohol and colour and no longer the sine qua non. We kind of quite like low alcohol and pale wines, which um, is good news for you, really, in a way. Uh, and acidity and freshness are seen as positive qualities nowadays, which they weren't 10, 20 years ago. Um, I agree completely about the, the rise of disease-resistant varieties. In uh, New Zealand, I was told that it's cloud there's definite plans to make Cloudy Bay not from Sauvignon Blanc, but from disease-resistant Sauvignon Nipis. So, you heard it here first, perhaps. Uh, but I do think they're going to be planted more and more. And we're just going to have to introduce the public to them. Uh, another trend, obviously, is more and more geographical specificity. So more and more single vineyard wines, but you're way ahead on that particular trend. I think red wine is no longer king. You've got a shortage of Chardonnay. There was a shortage of Chardonnay in New Zealand. Um, I think the tide has turned. And I remember in, um, when I started writing about wine, white wine was the bee's knees, much more sought after than red. So it's just a pendulum. If you hang around long enough, the pendulum swings in the other direction. Rosé and sparkling, both big trends. And I, I, I hear that sparkling's becoming a bigger and bigger thing here, which is very interesting. Pet gnats as well. Piquette, um, who would have thought? This sort of strange mix of great remains and water would find a market, but it does. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and, and wines, you know, it's, I don't think we're any more thinking the grape is sacrosanct and you can only make wine with grapes. You know, there are, there are more and more interesting drinks being made with grapes and other fruits. So I think we, ha we need to sort of undo our blinkers. And this is all, of course, without mentioning the N-word for natural wines, which we certainly don't have time for. Um, <laughs> that was a nice out, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> uh, tourism experiences, so important. That's what people want now. They don't just want liquid, they want experiences. They want something they can tell their friends about. They want to go to your tasting rooms and ha have something interesting happen to them. So I would suggest, and, and there are a lot of people, young people in particular, but not just young people, who whose view of wine is, is um, who want to be educated about wine. They want to go to a wine class. They want to learn. And, you know, you're in a great position if you have a charismatic person in the tasting room or yourselves to uh, hold wine classes, wine courses, and add value to your own, your own wines. I nearly said brands, but that would sound too markety. Um, so I think that's, that, those are great opportunities. I hope what I've said is... is pinged a little bit, and I haven't actually seen anyone asleep, or at least if they are, they're hiding very well. Um, so thank you very much for that. <laughs>